it's very flattering to be regarded one of the, the greatest short course athletes in the world and a lot of that just comes from my deep passion to for the sport but also to be the best at something and my passion for the sport is the people around it and the community that we have of triathletes young and old I just love being a part of it and then I think wanting to be the best at something driven by the sense that when I train I love that pain that I set at, the, the threshold that you can sit at for, for such a long period of time. and I actually enjoy that feeling of going to where I haven't been before and testing myself like I've never tested myself before. And I was hoping that as I've gotten into my 40s and now 43, that that passion and, and wanting to do, to test myself and do things that I haven't done before would maybe fade away. Um, Unfortunately, it hasn't. I, I still love to compete and I love to find out more things about myself. And yes, it's becoming more, there are more adversities as I'm getting older. There's injuries always around the corner, another injury, and fatigue is setting in a little sooner than it was in my 30s. Um, but I still truly love the sport and, I, and I'm really enjoying it. For the moment I'm just working at getting my body healthy again. I've started three Ironman 70.3s this year. Uh, two of them, you know, I finished sixth I think and then the third one I had to pull out with a bit of a hamstring injury that I've had for, for a while. So my number one focus right now is spending about six to eight weeks just getting healthy. And you know, the swimming and biking are coming along fine but you know, unless you're running you know, the best in the world, or at least top five in the world, you're not going to win the major events. So it's crazy to have irrational goals. So for me, it's about working on that run and getting it back to a place that I can feel confident to hop on any start line in the world and go, right, I'm ready to win this race. Um, you know, I'm contracted to race the Beijing International Triathlon in September, and I've really enjoyed that the last couple of years. Um, so I'd like to make that a, a definite goal and then probably because of this first half of the year dealing with a few injuries I'll back half the year and look towards some half Ironman whether that be Challenge or 70.3s um, and see what we can win. 100% my love of the sport is in the Olympic distance and whether that be drafting you know the ITU series I just I can't get enough of it I watch it the whole time and and I love watching these young guys just come up and do things that, you know, my generation we could never even fathom were possible. You know, watching whether it be the Brownleys or Gomez or Mario Mola and, and the girls racing in the ITU is just phenomenal with Gwen Jorgensen and Helen Jenkins and these girls coming through are just so phenomenal that it's, it's hard not to be enthralled. If you love our sport, you, you have to love that style of racing. Personally, I, I truly love the Olympic distance non-drafting, you know, the bike was always a bit more of my weapon. It, if I look at the three disciplines, swimming, biking and running, I think the, the bike time trial was the one I got a gift at. Um, I've never had to train very, very hard at it, I just get that one. Um, but I've had to train incredibly hard in the swim and the run to become one of the greatest in those two disciplines, but fortunately for me, the non-drafting Olympic distance series became big the last 10 to 15 years and I was able to have a lot of success there. But as these last few years, Lifetime series, you know, the Lifetime Fitness, they put on a great series and that's disappeared for the professionals. And in the same year we lost the high V triathlon and, and that um, was obviously a, a big kick uh, in the butt for all of us. But you know, and so there's been a bit of a transition to go, well, if you want to be a professional athlete, you've either got to do ITU draft legal or you go to the, the longer distance. And, you know, I, I'm not upset by it. I, the fact is I had my turn in both the ITU and, and the Olympic non-drafting and I can't complain. I was very well looked after. But um, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I don't love the 70.3 distance. Um, that's just a personal feeling and, and I certainly don't love the Ironman. Uh, I actually don't mind the training, to be honest. I love, 
you know, it's nothing more fun than going out for five, six hours on the bike and, you know, going for two hour runs, but they don't have to be at the same pace like I had to do in the shorter stuff. You actually got to go a bit slow for the Ironman. So the kind of training I don't mind, but for me, I've always enjoyed the head-to-head -head racing. I'm winning races by a second to 10 seconds and the margin of difference is so, you can't afford anything to go wrong. I love that intensity. Um, but you know, each to their own, right? I mean, and that's why I love our sport. I, I love the fact that I can see these young guys that couldn't quite make ITU as well as they'd hoped. And then they've gone on to be, you know, Crow, Craig Alexander, Crowey is a great example. He was a solid Australian boy, ITU, but struggled to make world championship teams for Australia and everything ITU. And then he transitioned very well to the 70.3 distance and then obviously well to win Kona three times. And that's why I love it about our sport. There's an opportunity for everybody. And whether it's ITU or all the way through to Ironman, we're all very fortunate to have, it, have that opportunity. Uh, I think as I'm getting older here, I'm actually becoming less intense. Um, I mentioned to my wife, Laura, who's also a professional, uh, this last probably 12 months, as we've done more long course training, we, and we look back and we're like, wow, for the last 15 to 20 years, we've been really intense. Never going to bed past 8.30, getting up at five, everything mattered. I remember, you know, going out for runs and every second per kilometer that was off mattered. You know, when I dived into the pool and I came in and I was doing 100 repeats and I was half a second to a second off the splits that I believed would get me to the first swim boy in all those races. That mattered, you know, and, and that intensity, you know, it carried through our house. We both, both Laura and I going to the Olympics and trying to become world number one and all of that. And it's been in the house and been so intense for so long. And um, it's been actually really quite enjoyable as we moved more to the longer course to go, hey, just get the work in. It's okay, just get the work in, get the work in. And, and it's, it's almost nice to leave that intensity. And I remember doing an interview once about 10 years ago and they're like, oh, you know, how important is the training hard and blah, blah, blah. I said, training hard's the easy part. It's doing all the other little things right. It's coming home after five hours on a bike or a two hour hard run where you, you've been running under six minute miles and you're bugging. Jumping in the ice bath, doing the rollers, you know, eating the right food, the timing of eating the right food. All of those things, they all matter so much that that was the tiring part, actually doing all those little things. Just going out for an hour to five hours of training is, well, it's the fun part, you know, your body turns up and you do it. Keeping your body healthy so you can keep performing consistently and what you've got to do to make it consistent, it's, that's hard work. And the person that masters doing those little things better than anybody else will be the, one, the winner at the end of the day. They might take time if they're not quite as talented, but they will get there. Because hard work, you know, if you're passionate and you want to be the best in the world, hard work is easy. Yes, yeah, so the bike we did on um, a few days ago was for me to sit close to my um, functional threshold, power. I don't use a power meter at the moment. I tend to go a couple of years on, a couple of years off. I can, you know, I, I think there's a lot of room for power meters and I think if you can afford one, get one. But I, I like to have sometimes a clean head and just go by feel. And so, the weekend's ride was, you know, I've ridden that canyon, it's 37 kilometres. I used to time trial it every Saturday through 07, 08, 09. I know the canyon well, I have my time splits that I like to measure. Um, and what we have around Boulder here with these long canyons between two and I think the steepest gradient we get is about 8%, but it allows you to really keep the power up, but you don't have to overthink it, you know. So I went up that. I stayed in my 56 chain ring the whole way and that forces me to A, get a lot of strength in the legs and B, sit at a decent functional threshold of power. Um, and yeah, it, w it was a solid ride and, and I turned that ride into, you know, just under a 100 mile ride. We, 
I like to warm up fairly firm before that climb. So yes, on the way out we were we were getting there um, pretty quick. Um, and quite often when I do an hour of or an hour and a half of sort of um, functional threshold, I like to keep the whole workout up. So it's not just that. I like to keep the and then to the the pre the warm up and if you like the two hour cool down or as much just about aerobic conditioning then with that decent amount of threshold in the middle and you know one thing I feel like I'm lacking at the moment is I have very good um, sort of 10 to 40k power but I'm lacking that in the last 30 kilometers of the 90 kilometer um, for the half Ironman so for me I'm just trying to get a little bit better conditioned on the bike um, still keeping in touch with my, my power but then also work on the conditioning side of it as well Proudest moment. I've been asked that a few times, and it's not an easy one to answer because there's, um, you know, I, I think if I look back and if I go all the way back, um, 94 and making my first world championship team for Australia, I remember that, that was a real, a real highlight, you know, a 22 year old kid, I'd never made junior teams or anything and then the Australians call me up and say, hey, you're on the start list for um, Wellington World Championships in New Zealand that year. And that, I still remember it because I remember mum and dad and the whole feeling, it was, it was very special. Um, to winning first sort of Australian titles and things was also a highlight. To finally, uh, well not finally, but um, you know, winning the World Series two times in a row in 02 and 03, that really, winning, winning that World Series a couple of times really made you feel like, I don't know, you, you felt like you owned it a little bit for, for a while. I mean, I, I say own it and I mean that lightly because I don't think, we all just borrow being the best for a while. No one's the greatest forever. And I almost, my brother said it best to me, he's like, yeah, it's almost like you, all the training is like a deposit just to rent something. You know, I said, yeah, that's pretty much it. You get to rent to be the best for a bit. And that's why I think you've got to be careful. You know, I see it with a lot of athletes. They, they get to be world number one and their personality changes. And it's like, but guys, you're just borrowing this moment in life, you know, in this period of time. So for me, that, that world number one was huge. And then, um, honestly, I don't think it was a greater day probably than winning that Lifetime Fitness Series, um, you know, when they said, hey, we'll put up uh, 300 grand if you win the whole series, plus another 60 for Minneapolis, another 60 for Dallas, another 60 if you win the series. And to go five from five that year in 2007 and win the entire series and, and handle the pressure that went with it, you know, and that's where my wife, she's just fantastic at helping me with, I'm very a passionate person, but she helped me with my emotions and and I remember just winning that race and just being like, oh. it was such relief. That one was a relief win, you know, and I, I was talking to someone the other day that sometimes you win where it's relief and you kind of put your hands up, but you really, it's not this overjoy, it's just oh, relief. And then there's other times, like when I won um, the big money race, the high V non-drafting race in 2011. So I was 39 and I was kind of the guy that, you know, had had his day and I broke away on the bike and then held them off on the run. And that wasn't relief, that one was shock and unbelievable. And I remember running on that blue carpet the last couple of hundred meters with 10,000 people in the stadium and going, just, just floating, you know, because it was disbelief, just being, oh, this is awesome. And, and if I think about it, you know, the, those probably moments throughout the last 20 years, um, have been really the, the highlights. And it's almost like, you can almost see that it's almost every five years or so. It's actually not, not that consistent. And, you know, I talk to the young professionals and, you know, what's a tip you can give us? Well, biggest tip is get, be okay with losing, but always strive for, to win, you know? And, because you're always gonna lose a lot more than you're ever gonna win. And that's just statistics. Maybe unless your name's Javier Gomez. But the rest of us, we have to get used to losing and then when we win, oh man, it's so special. Well, Kona, fortunately I got to race Kona in 2012. Um, 
I didn't make it a priority that year after winning High V in 2011. I really wanted to win High V again in 2012, which I didn't. I came third, but I, I gave a good. You know, I was very proud of my effort. But in doing so, I I probably didn't give Kona enough of the um, respect and attention it deserved. But I knew I was doing that. I think it was a conscious decision. And um, don't get me wrong. If I could run down a Lehi Drive, you know, with the wind. <laughs> I think it'd be a, an incredible feeling, and you know I've I've watched Kona since the mid '80s, and um, you know now Mark and Dave are good friends, and and even over this last 10 to 15 years with Crowy and Rinnie and Macca and Pete Jacobs and just so many great friends who've gone on to win it. Of course I, I'd love to win it, but I I look at it and go, you know I've had my turn, in, and what I got was these things over here. What Crowey got was this, and what Macca got was this, and what Whitfield got was this, and we all grew up together. And, you know, between all, all, all of us, and throw Hamish Carter in and a couple of others, we've, we've pretty much done the lot. And to some degree, we almost shared what was available. And, um, you know, my thing was over here. And I wouldn't change it, you know. I, I, I was so, so blessed and fortunate to get what I got from the sport. And, you know, and then looking forward, it's about, okay, how can I share some of the knowledge that, you know, um, both my wife and I have been in the sport for almost 60 years together and uh, combined, and then probably 40 years combined professionals. We have a fair bit of information and now we're just sitting down going, right, what's going to be the best avenue to be able to share our knowledge and, and help others in the sport to hopefully find their own best self?